Hey everybody, Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. Here we are in the legendary Sherfy Peach Orchard. The Emmitsburg Road is right behind the camera. You'll be hearing some vehicles going uh, by here and there. That's one of them right there. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. Please share this with your friends so as many people as possible can see it. We have some additional guests uh, with us today. Looking forward to bringing them on. But first, I think we need to talk about why we even talk about the Peach Orchard in the first place. This is Sherfy's Peach Orchard. He expands that Peach Orchard before the battle. Um, it's a substantial orchard. He has other business Business interests going on and whatnot, and he also has a lot of land holdings. In fact, some of the, the bloodiest fighting at Gettysburg, the Rose Woods, the Wheat Field, and many other areas around the Peach Orchard are all really Sherfy's land. It's the bloodiest, according to some, bloodiest single property in all of American history. And it is because on July 2nd, 1863, Dan Sickles, not satisfied with some of the ground on the line to which he was assigned, specifically that north of Little Round Top, decides to move his, his soldiers out here to this high open ground called the Peach Orchard. Here, he can see in every direction. Here, he can finally use his artillery and whatnot. But here, he is right up to the enemy line. closer to the enemy than he is to his own guns. Look at that. Barksdale's Mississippians are over in this direction. You've got uh, uh, Kershaw South Carolinians off in that direction. He's closer to the enemy than to his own. Sickles comes up here. He takes up a, man, a line that he does not have enough men to man, um, so he's got gaps in his lines. And here he creates a dangerous salient, okay? So we have this salient here. We've got Sickles men facing that way, Sickles men facing that way. The first threat will come from that, from that way. And to talk about it first, let's bring on Doug Downs, licensed battlefield guy, U.S. Army War College. So if you think about it, we know that Longstreet's been marking, making this flank march ever since this morning. When they break out of those woods at about 3.30 in the afternoon, they realize they cannot conduct the attack they expected to, which was to be one division followed and traced by another and tack up the Emmitsburg Road, rolling up the Union line. They can no longer do that. So what they do is they have a brief war conference, and what they decide to do is extend the Confederate line almost another mile, and they're going to launch an, an echelon attack. What's that? Imagine a wave hitting a beach on an angle, or you can think about this in terms of dominoes. The first domino will fall at about 4 o'clock, run into Little Round Top, Devil's Den. The second one will go about 5 o'clock. This will be Kershaw's South Carolinians. They're going to cross this field. Picture long lines of Confederates marching from our right to our left across this field. And now we can start to see, because today we're standing true at the salient. When the Union soldiers that are here facing the Confederate line in that far tree line realize there's Confederates that have given them their flank, they're going to rush down to the southern end of this peach orchard and they're going to fire into the northern flank of Kershaw. Longstreet will actually bring that brigade all the way out to the Emmitsburg Road before he will go back and catch up with the next domino. This is going to be William Barksdale, fiery Mississippian congressman, and he's going to have his 1,300 Mississippians just over there. His men will be fought at by shot at by Union cannon, and he will say, I wish you'd let me go in. I'll take those batteries in five minutes. Now, ultimately, Longstreet will say, patience, General. We're all going in presently. And what he allows is for this reaction to take place, and then finally at about 6 o'clock in the evening, he's going to unleash Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade. 1,300 Mississippians will cross this 500 yards in just under five minutes. They're going to slam into this peach orchard position, as well as the Sherfy house and barn, and this is what obliterates the salient position. For all the Union soldiers at the southern end of this field, they now have Mississippians behind them, and that doesn't work. And so they're going to fall back try and establish another position before they will fall back. Now, Barksdale, interestingly enough, one of his regiments will continue down this road, but the rest of his brigade will swing north and start to flank the rest of the Union soldiers up there, including Humphrey's line, and I'm going to turn it over to Doug Ullman to tell us about what happens with them. So, Andrew Atkinson of Humphreys uh, is the commander of the 2nd Division of the 3rd Corps, and just a few days before this, George Meade has asked him if he wants to be his chief of staff, and instead Humphreys says, no, I want to be commanding troops in the battlefield. And so his, his division, or rather two brigades of it, are lined up along the Emmitsburg Road when this attack begins. Now, Humphreys is already short-staffed. His third brigade under George Burling has been pieced out all over the battlefield, so he's got two brigades left with him that of uh, Carr 
and Brewster, the Excelsior Brigade. And so the Excelsior Brigade is going to wheel and try and face against Barksdale. It's going to be no good. In the meantime, Carr is getting pressure from Confederates coming across the fields west of the Emmitsburg Road, and ultimately Humphreys, despite his best efforts, is going to have to fall back. He's going to constantly try and rally his men to fight back the Confederates, but it is, he is completely outnumbered and outmatched, and he's going to rely on the artillery to help him take him back across the Trosel Farm. Very cool. Thanks, Doug. So here we are. There's a lot going on right here, right? I mean, Union Union dominoes are falling. The Confederates come over. We could talk for an hour about why the Confederates were able to roll over this pretty strongly held position so much. People talk about how maybe they were oriented in the wrong direction and Barksdale surprised them somehow coming on so quickly. There's lots of theories, but, uh, you know, to bring it down to earth a little bit about both material culture and otherwise, let me bring, our, bring on our really good friend who's been in this business longer than any of us. I don't mean anything about his age here. Dana show America's Civil War and Civil War Times Magazine. Come on, Dana. Hey, thank you, Gary. Thanks for having me on. I am the only one here with gray in my hair, so, you know, it does sort of indicate some venerable wisdom, perhaps. But I don't know the fighting nearly as well as these other fellows, but I thought you all might like to see this Gardner explosive bullet, which I acquired from a relic dealer. Now, this was dug up on the peach orchard in a peach orchard vicinity years ago when it was private property. I don't condone relic hunting on the battlefields now by any means, but these bullets are only found at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. It's interesting because it's made out of a, pu a pewter metal instead of lead because it was filled with an explosive compound that was supposedly ignited when the gun was fired, it bored, th bored burned through the fuse and would ignite as it approached an enemy line. The pewter was used because it was more brittle and would shatter into fragments. So it's very interesting to think that some federal regiments on this position were using this type of bullet. They're, they're not all that common. But sort of, I'm approaching this more or less as a lay person because I don't know much about the fighting here and I'm learning a lot. And one of the things that I find intriguing about coming out here is the fact you can't see much when you're in this peach orchard. The flanks of these Federals are below ground, they're down in swales. The men to my right might not know what's going on in this area, be totally taken by surprise. And it really is an eye-opening experience to come out here with these guys and learn about the action. The other thing is that Farmer Scherfe, I have to feel sorry for, he's just expanded this large peach orchard and he has a wealth, uh, wealthy operation going here and it's ruined, terribly ruined, in one day of fighting. So the civilian aspect out here is also important to remember and reflect on. Yeah, good. Thanks, Dana. Let's walk a little bit here. And it's so true. I mean, we constantly think, you know, oh, this was a battlefield. Oh, you had the honor to live in Gettysburg during the battle. No! I mean, your crops are ruined, your rails are poisoned, you know, your kids have a good chance of being blown up when they find some sort of an artillery shell later. Um, the town is thronged with tourists, and it's just a completely different, their whole lives changed overnight when the armies just happened to come here, when the roads just happened to bring them here. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're walking around the Peach Orchard with all sorts of guests, and you can see all these cannons here. So this is known as a Union artillery position, right? Because you've got Third Corps artillery, U.S. artillery reserve batteries, coming up here, right? And they are firing off in that direction. But it is just as much a Confederate artillery platform, right? So let's bring on Chris Mikowski, Emerging Civil War, to talk a little bit about E.P. Alexander and more. So on the 3rd of May, in early morning hours, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, Joe Hooker has consolidated his line into a big horseshoe, and at the very tip, as a salient at Hazel Grove, sits Dan Sickles. And Hooker rides out there and he says, look, you're too exposed. I want you to pull back. I want you to give up this high ground so we can have a more consolidated position. Sickles doesn't like the order. He thinks that he, he, if he gives up the high ground at Hazel Grove, it's going to give the Confederates an artillery platform to bombard the Union position. But Hooker says, no, 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 pull back. And so Sickles gives up the high ground at Chancellorsville. Confederate artillery takes that spot. And then there is the devil to pay for the Union Army as a result in what becomes the bloodiest, or second bloodiest day of the Civil War. So now let's flash forward to July 2nd, when Sickles sees a piece of high ground out in front of the main Union position. And he is told to stay back there. But he's thinking of Chancellorsville, where he had given up a piece of high ground that the Confederates used to their uh, excellent advantage. So he's going to advance out here because he doesn't want to give up that high ground. So what happens at Chancellorsville influences his decision to take this position here. And it is a great piece of high ground if you come out here. Um, you can see it, it's much better than what he had back there. But because of the, all the things we've talked about, the way it stretched out his line, it becomes problematic. So when his line finally collapses, 
and you know George Meade and his staff see him out here and he says uh, the Confederates are not going to let you give up that spot without a fight and of course Longstreet proves him right. So as Sickles loses his leg, his men lose their position, everyone falls back pell-mell, Confederates are going to come up and once again use this piece of high ground as an artillery platform to begin bombarding the main federal line. Um, E.P. Alexander, the First Corps' chief of artillery, comes out here and he talks about the sense of exhilaration that it is for an artilleryman to have the enemy on the run fleeing across those fields. It's one of the moments he is fondest of in the entire war, the exhilaration that he feels. His boss, James Longstreet, comes out onto the field with Joe Kershaw, and as they survey the collapsing federal line, they realize now is the time to continue this attack, but Longstreet is spent. It's now time to pass the baton to A.P. Hill's Third Corps, and they're gonna try to continue things with Richard Anderson's division north of this attack. And this is where things are really gonna start to fall to pieces for the Confederates, which we'll talk about a little later. Gary? Okay, I'm gonna bring on Doug Dowds in just a second, and then Dana Schof again, but just real quick, uh, you know, this is confusing stuff. You don't grasp the Battle of Gettysburg overnight. You might start to get it by core after a little study, and maybe you get it down to the division level, or maybe you focus on one area. Like, maybe you choose, for some reason, the Peach Orchard is your first place you wanna study, and that's what you get good on. But don't worry if it doesn't make sense to you yet. Just keep plugging away, and it will. Watch the American Battlefield Trust Gettysburg animated map. Seven 17 minutes, it goes through the whole campaign and the battle, um, maybe to take you through it. Uh, you can watch other videos or study some maps. The Trust offers all sorts of maps on its website at battlefields.org. Um, so let me turn it over to Doug Dowds for some more insight as we move along. So it's a really great snapshot of the organizational culture of both armies that are fighting here. If we think about the idea that Dan Sickles moves out here, what's the breakdown in communication that allows for one-seventh of the Union Army to displace itself nearly three-quarters of a mile in front of the rest of the Union line? Well, part of this has to do with personal relationship between General Meade and General Sickles. But then we also think about what are the implications of this? So this may have made sense in you know, his own decision making for General Sickles to come out here based on his experience from the last battle. However, when he moves out here, he takes up a position he doesn't have enough men for. He's three quarters of a mile in front of the rest of the Union Army. He creates a quarter mile gap on his right. He doesn't even defend the high ground on a little round top anymore. And worse, he never tells General Meade that he's gonna do this. And because of that, he really pulls all of General Meade's initiative. He sucks up the reserve that's the fifth corps. He requires the second corps to support him. He has to tap into the artillery reserve, 118 pieces of artillery that the Army of the Potomac owns. And of course, he'll ultimately have to send Governor K. Warren up to Little Round Top. On the flip side, if we look at the Confederate Army, we also see some dynamics here. An army that started a flank march and ends up in that tree line at 3.30, that seems like a long time for them to get to that tree line. But once they come out and they realize they cannot conduct this attack as planned, it takes them less than an hour to extend their battle line another mile to the south, change it to an in echelon attack, and we should ask ourselves, how are they able to do that? Remember, in the reorganization of the Army of Northern Virginia, it is Longstreet's Corps that is unchanged. The idea that Hood and McClaws had fought next to each other on other battlefields, that these units were used to fighting next to one another, is part of the reason that Longstreet would call this the greatest three hours of fighting done by any troops on any field of battle. We see the breakdown organizationally when we transition to a new Corps commander, and perhaps that gives us some insight about Robert E. Lee's complaint at the end of the day, that except for a proper concert of action, we would have been more successful. Gary. Good, good, Doug. And, you know, let me move this along a little bit, too, because so far with this wheat field and peach orchard actions, we're, of course, talking about the third core. We're talking about some of the fifth core reinforcements that come up here. We talked about the second core, you know, uh, you know, Caldwell's division, Cross, Kelly, Zook, and Brook. But you've got two other corps involved here. And, in fact, you've got all but two Union Corps fighting out here, including the artillery reserve, all but the 1st and 11th, because elements of the 12th Corps arrive late on the 2nd to help stem some of the tide. And you have elements of the 6th Corps that are fighting in the North Valley of Death. The 1 6th Corps unit to fight on the second day, I'm introducing this so we can really talk about the third day here, um, is Nevin's Brigade, the 3rd Brigade of the 3rd Division of the 6th Corps. And one of those units is the 139th Pennsylvania, and they help stem the tide on the second day, but then they make some action on the third day. Dana? Yeah, I uh, am particularly interested in, in Nevin's Brigade because I've, I've edited the papers of John Nevin, who was actually the major of the 93rd Pennsylvania, a different Nevin in that same brigade. But that brigade will spend the night of July 2nd on the John Weikert farm lane, which is out of sight through those trees. But if you see that small Greek cross, that monument that's low to the ground, that's a monument to the 139th Pennsylvania for July 3rd fighting. 
Now on July 2nd, they're going to spend the night there, but after Pickett's charge is repulsed, that brigade, Wheaton's brigade, or Nevin's brigade, however you, uh, as Gary called it, Nevin takes that command position later in the afternoon on July 2nd, as long as the Pennsylvania Reserves are going to advance across the Valley of Death to drive the Confederates back that are remaining in this area. And there's very heavy skirmishing that takes place across those fields. That monument will actually march, mark the apex of that attack by the 6th Corps Brigade, the 139th Pennsylvania. They have two monuments on the battlefield like a lot of Pennsylvania regiments because they put one up before the state started funding monuments. So the state will fund monuments even if you already have a monument on the battlefield. So a lot of PA regiments have two. So the, Pennsylvania, the 139th Pennsylvanians move their first monument from the Weikert Farm Lane out to that position. It indicates the high, the high water mark of their advance on July 3, and their other monument remains on the John Weikert Farm Lane. But that's really heavy skirmishing that's often overlooked, right, Gary? I mean, there's a big, heavy, sort of heavy skirmish of July 3rd in this area. Absolutely cool. And I think we're going to wrap things up here, um, unless somebody has an open thing to actually uh, say at this point, because I think we've covered uh, the uh, Peach Orchard pretty well. We've talked a little bit about July 3rd, uh, about the movement toward this area of Nevin's Brigade. You have all sorts of other general movements, and eventually, of course, the Confederates will fall back um, at that point. So I don't think I have anything else to add. Open call if anybody else has anything. It looks like not, so um, uh, we're going to pick up wherever we can. We'll load things up as we get connectivity. We really appreciate you uh, joining us, and thank you so much for supporting Battlefield Preservation.